All right, great, thanks. Um, so I assume everybody is on. I don't see my list yet, but um, anyway, we'll progress. We've got till a quarter till the hour. So we got about 25 minutes or so um, for this discussion section. So I'd love to hear from everybody. Again, the charge for this one, the discussion questions are focused on, if you got those in front of you, the straw vision statement for building a more resilient, sustainable and transparent enterprise, um, what would we recommend changing? And what are some potential interim actions or milestones that would be key? So the goals to consider for building the more resilient, more sustainable and more transparent trial enterprise, improve community engagement, transparency and user friendliness, reduce complexity and streamline trials and trial startup, support regulatory robustness, flexibility and build an ability to adjust, reduce conduction of uninformative clinical trials, generate a large amount of high quality evidence at a lower cost, reduce risk aversion to improve research questions, embrace novel statistical techniques, and connect and embed clinical care and clinical research. So much of those things at the end are very much sort of around that idea of real world evidence, or um, at least how we would use that potentially in control arm settings to move things along. So I'll uh, stop there and see if there's any opening comments. It was interesting to hear Dr. Woodcock uh, actually talking about the academic centers potentially creating a uh, competitive disadvantage, if, if that would be the phrase, and limiting access to patients because of location versus actually reaching out into the community. Um, so we need a Repertoire, anybody want to volunteer to do the readout at the end? Again, it's, as you saw from the last uh, breakout session, it's a pretty short two-minute uh, piece that each group gets to do. Any volunteers? All right. Nobody speaking up yet? I'll do it, Jeannie. Oh, Jeannie, want to do it again? Oh, yeah, it's too much fun. I'll do it again. Plus, I get to take good notes and keep the notes, so it's good for me. Okay. All right, good. Well, you did you did a great job. You were very succinct and concise and on time, so I thought that was perfect. Um, so let's uh, let's begin um, and maybe go around and hear some thoughts from different people. Um, I see that everybody has switched over yet, uh, but let's get rolling. Any comments to, to kick off? I was going to, you know, I'm, I'm thinking of um, Elliot Levy's slide about the sort of the, the disconnect between, um, you know, uh, active, you know, compounds under investigation versus sort of societal level disease burden, you know, especially since I work in the mental health area. And that was the sort of outlier on the edge of, you know, minimal activity compared to the huge burden of disease. Um, to, to me, one of the this is a question that it, to me is a critical question, and I'm not sure we can answer it. But how much of that disconnect has to do with with uh, with the incentives problem, and how much of it has to do with sort of the upstream scientific problem that you know in some of those areas where we have these sort of you know complex heterogene heterogeneous you know especially CNS and metabolic diseases that we just don't have very specific targets. Um, you know, because I think what we've seen happen in cancer and immunologic disease is the ability to identify, you know, really specific targets that uh, that allow dramatic improvement, and that creates big incentives. Um, you know, it, it basically it's a classic sort of you know market differentiation, market segmentation strategy, which allows you to charge a really premium price. Um, let me walk th walk me through your incentive bit there just very quickly to clarify. So there's getting the patient incentivized because of the opportunity, the physician incentivized maybe because of the notoriety or the the chance to to be an author presenter, and then there's the financial incentive um, for the practice side. What to which are you are you referring to all three or to which in particular? Well, the uh, you know the, the the analogy I often use is you know what if somebody invented a Gleevec for schizophrenia. Right. which probably would not be a Gleevec for all schizophrenia. It would turn out to be a Gleevec for a very particular subgroup of people with schizophrenia. Um, would that then solve the problem? You know, would it say, you know, we've identified a dramatically more effective intervention for a subset of people and we're going with that? Because that's what's happened, you know, in, 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 in cancer and, you know, immunologic conditions. Um, would, 
is it just that we, we don't have the right target or is there something else about, you know, the, the sort of those kinds of conditions that that uh, that means that the investment just isn't there? Now that's, I'm sure it's not either or, but to me, that's a, you know, whether this is about sort of at the policy incentives level or whether this is really more at the basic science level, go find the right targets and everything else will follow. Yeah, yeah, right. I know again, again, if we find, no, you're right, if we find a, a target in a drug, it's amazing how the patients come from wherever they come from and physicians refer. So you're right, and you get pharmaceutical interest. Okay, great point, Greg. Other comments? You know, this is Jeannie. I just want to say something about just policy and clinical trials. So the Clinical Trial Treatment Act was passed late last year, kind of buried in one of the COVID bills that allowed Medicare patient, Medicaid patients to get coverage for standard of care costs for clinical trials. I, you know, it was a racist policy to begin with. Um, it's lifted. Okay, policy needs to turn into action. Uh, I think that there is a fair their amount of behavior that naturally happened not to include low income patients in clinical trials as a result of that act broadly. Um, so it's a real opportunity for change. Um, policy does enable change, but it doesn't actually, you know, um, make the change happen. So how do we turn po good policy into action? Um, and what policies need to be changed so that patients have better access to care in general and then access to clinical trials. Good, okay. Others? Deborah, any comments? Carolyn? All right, Helena. I'll make, I'll make another comment. Okay. Okay. Go ahead, Carolyn. Go ahead. Please, Carolyn. Oh no, I was. Um, I'm actually still reflecting on Janet's um, talk, opening talk, and wondering if we would discuss the feasibility of of this sort of long term community-based research enterprise, but that's not specifically to these points. Yeah, okay. Yeah, it is interesting. I mean, it depends on the disease and specifics. I mean, ASCO just released their uh, story about uh, dispersion of uh, across the country, and you've got uh, rural issues, but you've also got in the metropolitan areas a rapid decrease in access to the internet as you move outside. The story is about going from Chicago to Gary, Indiana, or from Manhattan to the other side of the Bronx. But um, I mean, all those factors sort of weigh in in terms of whether the academic medical center network is often the place to answer broad-based questions like came up with COVID or maybe comes up with some of the more common scenarios versus maybe an area where there might be a different level of disease expertise. So probably not one size fits all, but certainly with COVID going across the country, I think it exemplified the fact that we needed to go to the patient as opposed to expecting the patient to come to a center. Other comments? More of a question to the group, um, Howard. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. Um, I guess is what what sort of investments will be needed um, to sort of engender a more patient-centered clinical trial enterprise in the short term, right? So if so, you know, um, it's intuitive by Madame Anderson that sort of the academic environment is the majority of, of the footprint for these trials, but I was surprised to the degree to which it is. So if we were to sort of shift that, and that may or may not be the right thing to do, I suspect that it is, what type of investments will we need from an infrastructure, to your point, technology or digital access? Um, obviously there's a manpower issue as well. Like, and I think sort of that's how we catalyze this plan that we all have sort of bought into and very supportive of into action. And, and, and this is more, this is, I, I don't have the answer myself. I'm just kind of curious to see if that's a way to frame the discussion. The yeah, good. Yeah, so what are those investments? And do you say an AZ 
Yes, yes. Okay. Anyways, um, great. Anybody want to take a shot at that? Investments required to, to make that sort of change? I wonder if we can't um, put some sort of mandate or, or at least an onus on those academic medical centers to create that infrastructure and outreach. They're doing it for financial purposes. There's a large referral catchment that the academic the AMCs foster in order for patients to be referred in centrally to their AMC. Um, when they need for their care. So they are building those networks to some degree for other purposes. Okay. Other thoughts? I think what was clear was um, both from Dr. Woodcock and Dr. Lee's comments is we have all this technology and data available, whether it's real world evidence, genetics and, and omics, but there needs to be a coordinated, especially for addressing um, uh, data related and results to, to uh, populations that have not been addressed in the past is that requires a larger coordination and similar to our prior discussion in terms of identifying what data will be impactful, having that metrics and agreement. And uh, in terms of the investment, like that also, uh, because it's a lot of requirement of data management and IT, maybe individual institutions and research centers may not be able to accommodate that, but if there's a central coordinator place where they can contribute um, and be helped how to engage the patients and, and providers, that might at least help narrow the gap. And that, that may be like sort of a short-term goal to set up that infrastructure that's workable with small pilots and then in the long-term measure success of how we engage providers and patient populations that are different um, from the trials 10 years ago. Right. And, and that raises in my mind this idea of citizen science, right? So community participatory research, could that be an avenue to sort of close this gap, so to speak, right? Um, yeah, there needs to be more funding sources for that, that's for sure. Yeah. One, one of the things I wanted to share with you when uh, the vaccine development was going on, um, there was, I mean, what, what Janice said is so true that there's no real community-based research enterprise. Um, so Moderna is a relatively small company. <laughs> um, they reached out on LinkedIn to ask who knows um, individuals that can help to engage communities of color in the vaccine research that we're doing? That's it happened on LinkedIn, huh. um, which which makes you. I mean, and the email trail was you know ten yards long, um, but um, I think it did give them some answers. But it shows you how much of a problem this is that there's really no infrastructure for um, quality engagement of communities. One one thing that um, you know um, Janet Woodcock sort of you know hinted at I think but might be good to make explicit is is the contrast sort of between the the outpouring of sort of uh, energy and enthusiasm about research on COVID nineteen therapeutics in the U S versus the U K um, you know because you, as she was saying I mean what we saw in the U S was, was uh, you know, an incredible, you know, you know, everyone stepping forward and saying, we've got to solve this problem right away, but unfortunately in a very sort of uncoordinated way. So as she said, you know, we had, you know, hundreds and hundreds of what I've heard Rob Califf refer to as SCTs, by that he means small crappy trials, um, you know, that, you know, may have been not very well defined, used sort of incompatible, uh, you know, definitions of things, incompatible data standards and so on. And most of them didn't recruit very many people and, 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 so there was this sort of big outpouring of, of, of energy that, re that really was you know, wasted um, in contrast to what happened with recovery in the UK where there was much more sort of standardization. So there's this, to me, there's a really interesting tension between what we're talking about here in terms of sort of community-based activity and the value of that. But there are some things where we're saying, okay, if we're defining a particular clinical phenotype that we're going to extract from electronic health records, everybody doesn't get to everybody doesn't get to improvise on that, 
you know, there, there is a way to do that. Um, and, and you, of course, this is the story of America, you know, the, uh, you know, the, the inevitable tension between sort of individual freedom to do your own thing and the societal need to get our act together and do things in some fairly well-organized way. Don't get me started on the politics of that. Um, but this to me is, you know, if, if we're going to talk about, you know, sort of infrastructure, somehow we're going to have to think about what are the things where we need to say, unless there's a compelling reason to do it otherwise, you need to do it this way, the same way as everybody else. Um, yeah. Okay, good. Great. Other thoughts? Yeah, you know, I think on the infrastructure front, just, um, you know, just having heard the story, and I know we all agree, this whole idea of um, making sure that we have the internet available to, across the country in, in whatever shape or size. So that's a huge differentiator we got into even with providing telehealth during the pandemic and the folks that had access that didn't. Um, so I think that's a place I know we need to continue to support. It's also interesting just in terms too of allowing more things to be done locally. So I'm in Nashville, Tennessee. Sarah Cannon has a community-based network for cancer trials, but you get 90 miles outside of Nashville and you can be nowhere. And um, the, res the reticent around laboratories being done there or delivery of study materials, and yet Amazon and FedEx show up every day, you know? So those are, you know, this is the part a little bit where how you, how you work with the public private sector. I laugh, I did a little bit of time in Bosnia with the army many years ago and I couldn't get a package um, from UPS, from uh, the US Postal Service, but the UPS guy would just show up at your tent in the middle of nowhere in Bosnia. <laughs> um, so it's, it's interesting how those dynamics happen, but I do think we can, I do think this whole idea of taking the trial to the patient is can be done in many settings where it's pretty safe. We're not talking about first in human cancer trials. Um, and that's going to be a way to get a much bigger group of patients involved and in participating, just socioeconomic issues, child care, elderly care, all the things that we all understand. I like I like your example because it's a nice example of you know, large organization that's been able to be incredibly sort of personal on the ground in every place, but to have pretty standard processes to make that actually happen. Um, right. Yeah. Um, you know, there, there's some things that need to be completely personalized, but there's some things not. Um, you know, yeah. everybody can't everybody can't set up their own GPS system uh, and compete with each other. Like there, right. there's one GPS system. Okay. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Other comments or thoughts from the group? Thoughts on this side? Yeah, good. Oh, sorry, I was going to say, follow up to your question about technologies. Like everybody has a smartphone and an iPad, right? So to your point, it may not be FIH, but especially the outcomes we look at, you know, people's mobility or how they're doing. And, and even for things where you have questionnaire, you know, as Greg brought up sort of mental health, there are things that you can collect, right? And, and safely uh, without having people travel, you know, 50, 100 miles. And then uh, lastly is it may be um, to the example Jean gave about Moderna that even to have people have the information what's available, right? We can start with, can people get the information in ways they already do for so many things, <laughs> that, you know, on the internet or on social media. So even that acknowledging where's the nearest um, center, you know, what disease is available, and also the level of engagement that's required. So not all trials require them to come for broad draws every day, but if they're ones that they have clear um, understanding, you know, what's testing, what's the benefit, and what's the time requirement, we can actually get, get engagements in patients we've not been able to recruit in, in, the, in the past in clinical trials. Um, that, the other thing I just want to say, just from an infrastructure standpoint, I think in order to really meet the goals that we want to for clinical trials in the United States, we, we need to ensure standards for ADA compliant trials. Um, health literate information, culturally sensitive information, and linguistically appropriate information. I mean, all of that needs to be standardized and a requirement. We, we can't keep doing trials where, you know, people that unfortunately might not be mobile or in a wheelchair can't engage. We, we can't do that. So we need to be, um, we, we need to have trials for all of America and put those standards in place to ensure those requirements. Yep. 
The comment I was going to make is so just a reaction a few minutes here. So, you know, one of the goals is to embed clinical care and clinical research, and then, you know, how we robustly design trials, utilize data. Thoughts from the group on applicability and, and you know, use of real world evidence, real world data, whatever terminology you want to use. Um, any comments from the group on? that becoming more of a standard, maybe even in terms of control arms or the like? Like pragmatic clinical trials, you mean? Right, yeah, that's that's one version, sure, absolutely. You know, there, another, yeah, I mean, certainly in the cancer world, it's become more applicable that you use that database to sort of design the next study and make your arguments about whether or not you need a randomized trial. Uh, unfortunately, Amy's not on, I don't think, participating in this breakout. Uh, Dr. Abernathy, she has a lot of experience here, but any comments from the group on utilizing that data? Yes, so it's routinely used now in, in safety monitoring, and I agree. I, I think where, for things we measure routinely, for example, blood pressure, heart rate, you know, hemoglobin A1C, th there's definitely ways we can use that, you know, and again, minimizing the collection and, and the burden on patients. Um, and to your point, beyond controls, uh, e e even in just um, in approved trials where, where you have additional indications, that's where we've seen examples of that being used. Uh, but similar to technology, I think it's the, um, you know, do the um, individual academic centers have ways to make sure that that data comes in a structured way back, right? So uh, how are we gonna handle missing data? How are we gonna um, uh, make sure the data is standardized and who's gonna coordinate that? I think that, that that's where the, some of the difficulties in the past, but I think we've, you know, as Elliot said, we've made progress um, then the, the, the past decade. And I think the more people are committed to even contributing small step, I, I think we can get there. And especially with COVID where most things have had to move virtually and people have to be creative. Um, I think that we will see a lift there. Good. So somebody pointed to the example uh, a while ago about, you know, COVID, the, the you know, vaccine trials, uh, putting methods out there in the public domain. Um, you know, and, and how that was, you know, considered sort of, you know, a radical thing to do, but it was in a crisis. Um, and, and certainly, you know, it seems like that should become the norm. Um, the, the how to do research right should not be proprietary knowledge. Yes, exactly. Other folks in the group that haven't spoken up? Hey, Howard, I just want to interrupt for a second. We have about five minutes left until we go back into the main room. Okay, great. Thanks, Melvin. Deborah okay. or Talitha, anything to add? Go ahead. Yes, Carolyn. Oh, quick comment on data. I work, I do, I do a lot of work in that space. Um, I think that getting to standardized definitions um, and being able to assemble that um, that real world evidence across different instances of an EMR or what have you is, is um, requires considerable effort, but it shouldn't and is useful for many different purposes. It's also extremely desirable for um, just clinical quality improvement efforts. Um, so that strikes me as, as a problem we can solve with enough resource it's perhaps something to strongly consider prioritizing. Yes. Yeah, good. Carolyn, do you have an example of that? Like when that's been tried and it didn't work out well because data standardized? Um, um, not, certainly not in the trial space. I work more in the quality improvement space. Um, I work in learning health networks across, which operate across different health centers, um, sometimes even across um, different, different countries and borders. Uh, and you can't benchmark against one another and you can't do any sort of um, tracking of your clinical performance or your outcomes, your patient outcomes, without coming to some standard data definitions across all of these different centers. Yeah, and, and a lot of studies- so that it just, 
Yeah, a lot of studies are global, so that makes that challenges not only in the U.S., but outside the U.S. Good. Well, just in the last minute or two, anybody else with a comment or question? Anybody who didn't get a chance to speak up? Deborah or Talitha, any words of wisdom? Uh, this is Talitha. I'm sorry I missed um, some of the session earlier. I had to step out. So um, that I, I'm, I'm just trying to follow what, what occurred during the previous session. Okay. All right, good. Um, and I just uh, the only thing I'd add to terms in terms of the cost of things, I think that, um, you know, medic CMS, Medicare has always been willing to pay for standard of care for clinical trials. I think that, you know, it's just interesting and in, in doing studies is a big part of my daily job. How many times we create something um, that isn't necessary in the trials or that we continue to collect data long after we've establish that the regimen's safe or we've, you know, how, how many, obviously you want to follow some chemistries for a while, but just, I find the intensities in studies don't let up as you go month by month. And I've always been an advocate to sort of maybe de-complex or de-stress trials. I don't know that cycle eight or month eight needs to look like month one or cycle one in terms of the amount of data you're collecting. Obviously, it depends on the drug and the disease. But in general, you've got a patient sitting in front of you in cancer trials that are doing well, looking well, and tolerating the drug, and they're still jumping through the same hoops um, in October that they were jumping through in June when they went, or July when they went on the study, or January. I mean, it doesn't really matter. It's, it's an interesting phenomena. But I think that's a simple place to think about reducing some of the cost as well as the burden to the patient. Yeah. This is Talitha. You said that Medicare generally takes care of the standard of care for uh, some of the clinical trials. Is that the case with um, COVID-19? Yes. Good. Okay. Yeah. The Medicare has always been very good about, you know, um, paying for the, the whatever is the routine. So E&M visits, for exams, and basic chemistries, uh, basic tests that go. So, um, yeah, that, that's always been a place that they've been a big advocate for. Yeah. And then and, and Medicaid just came on. Right. Now the Clinical Trial Treatment Act allows Medicaid patients to be reimbursed for standard of care costs. Now that just happened the end of December. So, you know, I don't know how much that is known or whether or not that's actually in process, has behavior changed, you know, but um, that, that's important to advertise and enable. Yeah, exactly. That, that's an important 10% of the population that, um, probably was adversely affected to participate and often adversely affected with some of the health conditions. So thanks for bringing that up. That that was a long standing fight through Congress and the CBO to get that to be a believable need. Oh yeah, I know that that was a hero award uh, that that happened um, quietly. Yeah. <laughs> it seemed to happen quietly after a long fight. Yep. Yeah, yeah, exactly. All right, good. Well, I think we're right at the time. Um, looks like we're at zero, as I suspect they'll be flipping us out. But thanks, everybody, for the discussion. And, uh, Gene, thanks for reporting out for us. Sure, no problem. Thanks, everybody. Great comments.